Welcome to Space Between Words. How are you? I am good. How are you? Yes, I'm good. Summer's here. Summer's here. You like summer? I do. Mm -hmm. I like it, well, this summer specifically, because it it rains, and I know it's Greenville. I know we live in Greenville. It's different, but it it rains, and then it cools it off a little bit, Mm -hmm. so it's not so hot. Um, Yesterday, it rained, and it felt like we lived in a jungle, though. I'm not going to lie. It was humid. It was very humid. (laughs) I don't mind it, though. You don't? No. My skin is so much happier here. Oh, that's very true than living in Redding when it was, like, dry. Yeah. Yeah. It It was crazy. So it is a little muggy, though. Yesterday was uh, was special. You could feel it coming off the ground. Yeah. We we were walking from our house to uh, Hampton Station, and... um, there's like a part of the trail that's very jungle-like, and um, we heard this noise, and I look over, and there's this like animal, a very giant gray animal that we don't know, but it was in the trees, not on, anyways, and then it wrestled away, and I was like, where do we live? <laughs> like, what that's is in there? the middle there? of the city, too. Yes, so little... I'm like, what is in there? Anyways, that was a fun Fun walk. So summer's here. Summer's here. You got any plans this summer? Any fun trips? Oh, man. I start traveling in August. Okay. So it's crazy busy. So I'm just trying to relax until then. We have camp coming up. So that's fun. Mm -hmm. And um, so all the things. But uh, you are about to leave. Yeah. We take a team to Romania on Monday. We'll be gone for uh, almost two weeks, a week and a half-ish. Hey, that's so cool. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. Last time we were there, we were supposed to be there for a week in 2018. And we landed and our... Reading at the time, a big forest fire came into the city, burnt down 1,200 homes. So we were scrambling to get back. Oh, so we wow. were like in Romania for like a day and a half, two days. Because we like, we got to get home and help because the church became a distribution center for all the evacuations. Wow. So, yeah. So we didn't get a full experience yet. So this time, um, going back and looking forward to it, taking a team of 23 people. So, yeah, it's going to be good. We're excited about it. That's cool. Yeah, it's really Monday. Yeah. Um, But I'm guessing if you listen to our last podcast, you might be wondering what happened (laughs) to your poor Tesla that died on the side of the road and you got heckled and all the things. Is there an ending to that story? Yes. Um, (laughs) I I learned, uh, if you didn't listen to the last podcast, I would learn that um, if if you're a Tesla owner and you break down on the side of the road, people will stop and make fun of you yes. and laugh at you out loud. Like stop on an on-ramp to an interstate and mock you. So I experienced that. Okay. So it gets it towed up to Charlotte, and it was there for like three days, and they te- my app said the car is ready. So great. So I get up to Charlotte, and I'm like, so what happened to it? Oh, just look at your app. And so I get on my app, and there's a, like, a, like a spec sheet, like okay. a, you know, the invoice or whatever. And the part that broke, it said pyrotechnic something something for the rear motor. And I realized I have no idea. I mean, what I don't even know what that is. Is it like a little chip? Yeah. Or is it a, I have no idea. So it's like on a normal car. You're like, oh, I know the car part, generally speaking. But when a brand new technology is like, sure, okay, great. Pyrotechnic. Pyrotechnic. I just like see this little like fire be like, psst. Like, what did that? And I <laughs> think Elon, like- Elon and his team, when they were making this car, they thought, let's just name these parts completely unrelated to... Well, you can because yeah, it's new technology. Yeah, so and no one's going to know. Like, yeah. sure. What happened to your car? My pyrotechnic. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so my car is good, golden, and uh, it's great. So you're up and running now? I'm up and running. I'm back, and uh, I'm flying past every everybody that mocked me now. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. You were behind me the other day, and all I could think about was our last podcast of you were like, I could, I could go faster than everybody. And I was like, he's just waiting yep. to be able my to go around me. My arrogance is back. My ego is back. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I'm back. You're back. I'm, yeah. And you're supporting our new merch. Yes, blue. Bright blue. Yes. So if you can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> So I yeah. love it. It's our. It's called our PE collection. PE collection. So I um, wrongfully accused my wife on Sunday that she was mocking this new merch line, but I had to apologize. Yes, it, it was wasn't great. her. It was Reva. It was Reva that did. Reva it. said this is the PE collection. So we got gym bag, tote bags, on. Um, all of that stuff. So it was fun. I loved it because uh, you shouted out all the homeschoolers that this would be a good collection for them. <laughs> I was so like, could. yes, I should, I should have planned this. I should have incorporated that. You should have. Like, so. hey, you don't have your school colors, but studio has it for you. We got, and- we t- we got your PE class <laughs> yes. here taken care of. I love this. So, yep. Uh, we are actually coming up on three years. Three. Isn't that wild? Living here. So June 21st, you guys landed. Yes. And then Candace and I landed June 22nd. Isn't that crazy? That's wild. 
We're here. Three years. I know. Someone sent me a photo of the pop-up we did right before we moved downtown. We did like this quick little meetup. Heard, yeah. And I don't know if it's funny, but half of the people in that photo aren't here anymore. And the other half are all in, so that's funny. Yeah. Um, but it, like that was felt like such a long time ago. It, yeah. And that was three years ago. Yeah. And so it's weird how time feels right now, to me at least. I don't know if it is for you, but three years feels like it's taken forever. Yeah. And yet three years barely took it's like nothing. it took any time. Yeah, yeah. Was that the same for no, you? No, I would definitely agree. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, anything that you pioneer probably feels like it feels a little bit forever because mm-hmm. you're like slugging through things. But then on the other hand, you look at like where we have gotten in three years and you're like, man, that's actually amazing that we're here. So It's true. Yeah. It does feel like we're older than three years. It does. Well, yes. <laughs> in some in some areas. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, it was a, definitely a whirlwind mm-hmm. of of starting the church and, and fast forwarding to opening the church doors way quicker than you guys expected. Yeah. I heard someone say a couple of weeks ago, I said, for people that are pioneers or founders, they have to have a higher pain threshold than normal. That's so real. I'm like... Oh yeah, that's that's real. Could you have lots of opportunity to navigate your own soul and your own your emotional bandwidth and mental bandwidth, and so it's kind of fun at least to be three years after that, yeah. especially those days, and go, okay, we made it, we're alive, we're yeah. established, and we're building something beautiful. Yeah, because uh, none of us, a lot of us, didn't know each other when we came. It's true, and it was just funny because one of the first like pop up meetings that we had when we got here was at a um, theater that was. Gross and sticky Camelot theaters, Camelot right? theaters uh-huh. and it was. <laughs> so for people that don't know this story, we were looking for places to rent and use, and the only place we could find to have these many people that we knew wanted to be there was uh, uh, an active movie theater. Yes, it had like five or six theaters, and the way we could rent it was you'd rent it in be so you'd rent out a movie slot. So mm-hmm. instead of showing the movie, you go in. Yes, but the setup time. Is so could the previous, the movie would end, they clean all the junk off the kind floors. Kind of cleaned it, yeah. Kind of cleaned yeah. it, just kind of move it around. <laughs> and then you come in, and we had like 20 minutes 20 to minutes. set up an entire PA system, you know, welcome. And we're, like, we're trying to make this feel, like, amazing. And it was so stressful. Yeah. So we don't talk about it much anymore, but it's called the Camelot Theaters. Theaters. And uh, every time I drive by it, I just smile. I, yeah. That no, it's mo- it's real. Night. Especially because, I, you, I don't know if you remember this, but the stairs to get up on, on the makeshift stage that they had. There were no stairs. Yeah. It, we had to like... <laughs> We, I, what did we do? I don't I remember. We got a ladder. Like we makeshifted. We got a, yes. Yeah, it was like a weird step ladder, uh-huh. and you had to kind of, and it was wobbly because it was. Anyways, it just made me laugh thinking about all of that, and then us not knowing each other, and, and we were just like, run, <laughs> like create. It was, it was awesome. And we're also trying to put on this welcome. Welcome. We're all, we're all calm. Rushed out of our minds. So, <laughs> but we've come a long way. Since we have come a long way, and yeah. and I guess that's what segues us into what we want to talk about today. Yeah. Is looking at our culture mm-hmm. and the responsibility yeah. of us as leaders and what that looks like and and when we look at our culture and what we've built and how much is that of us. Yeah, yeah I was in a conversation recently with some um, a good friend of mine and some other leaders and we were talking about culture that you create and culture that you're leading mm. <clears throat> and the idea around... It's pretty common and normal for leaders or people that build cultures or build environments it's pretty common to experience um, time where you find yourself complaining about what's happening or you're frustrated or, or you know, you're just kind of like, I'm, I'm done or, you know, you just have all those emotions. Yeah. And, but the realization is we're often complaining about something that we're responsible for actually creating. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's one of the dynamics for leaders specifically or just honestly of your home. It could be your house. Yeah. It could be your family culture. You know, and it's like, so I think that the general kind of principle, if you've been leading or creating an environment for two, three, four, five years minimum, guess what? That culture environment is a reflection of you. Yeah. And that's hard to embrace, hard to accept because you realize, oh, I'm actually complaining about something that's actually an expression of myself. Of myself. And that is a, that is a. A rough spot to be. That's a rough spot. Yeah. And that's hard to admit. Yeah. And so I, and to be honest, I do find myself every now and then just kind of grumbling about things I'm experiencing with, with studio and things I'm experiencing in the culture. And I have to remind myself, oh, guess, guess, guess what, Eric? It's, yeah, it yeah. comes right back to me. 
come right back to our leadership. It comes right back to our, our main leadership team. Yeah. And so, and that's really hard to do as a leader. I mean, if we, I think it's, I think it's really helpful if we can be more genuinely honest and that, cause you can actually do something about that. Yeah. There are things that happen that you can do nothing about, yeah. but if you can change it on this side of the conversation, mm -hmm. then eventually it'll transpire into the conversation. This was an old podcast we did, but yeah. it was around the third place concept. Yes, Remember that concept? I do. Yeah. yeah. And zero and yeah. yeah. And the zero place. Yeah. And so I think if we can just take greater ownership of like the zero place, which is us, which is this is where everything comes from. If we can take greater ownership of that, then we actually see more of the external realities match what's going on in here. Yeah. And so. No, I think that's very humbling. Yeah. <laughs> because. Do you um, see that in things that you lead? I do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very, it's very humbling because I think it also helps you grow if you can admit that. Mm -hmm. It also helps you see the areas that you need to grow in and you need to, to, okay, this, this, this in my environment's happening. And, and like you said, there's always, there's things that, you know, you can't control, but there is like the overall culture. I think we heard um, someone, when we first moved here, I, I listened to someone say like, when you start something, you start with everybody culture, that everybody's bringing something of their culture into the place that you're building. So it takes a couple of years to figure out what your DNA of your culture is. And so it's vital that you set that culture almost like quickly and fast mm -hmm. so that people know what to expect, what part of their culture is going to live what's going to mm -hmm. die you know all of the things when it when a bunch of people come together to start something mm -hmm. and so then you have to look at you know a couple years down we're at three years what does that look like like do we love the culture we've built like um and what can i do to help it grow if i don't like the things that are happening what can i do in myself mm -hmm. um because if I want to build, you know, curiosity or whatever it is, I can be like, why is, why are these people not more curious? And why are they not going out and doing these things? And I look at my life and I'm like, oh, I've scheduled 12 things in my life that I can't actually go and do the things that I want my people mm -hmm. to go. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the other, the other dynamic for us, and, and you remember this, when we came here, we said we, we wanted to determine the material first before we decide what we're actually building. Yeah. And that's an interest. That's a very different approach than very coming different. into. At least for us, we were coming from into a brand new city, brand new part of the country. So everything was brand new. Instead of coming in like, "Hey, we're going to build X," we're like, "We don't even know if the material to build X exists in this area." Yeah. So on a, <coughs> excuse me, on a practical level, if I want to build a concrete house, but there's no concrete, concrete. available, then it it's a waste of my time to try to build a concrete house, or it can be very very nearly impossible to bring in concrete. So that's more of just a pragmatic, practical level. So on a on a people level, it's like, oh, we're dreaming about, and I we had all these dreams, but I remember, I remember sitting down with all of us saying, we have to, what is the material? What actually exists here to determine, oh, wood exists. Oh, they got brick, okay. Let's build with wood and brick instead yeah. of something that actually doesn't exist. So that added a different dimension, different dimension. to our, the yeah. culture we're actually creating. Yeah. And our expectation, I think, to me, it feels, I've never built something with that approach. Yeah. I've yeah. normally built something that already existed, came in after the fact, and took it to another level. Yeah. But starting from ground zero, going what actually exists, so that that our journey for all of us was like, we need to get to know what material exists. Yeah. And so that's a very different approach to building a culture and a leadership. Yeah. And then what's the balance? I guess my question to you is what's the balance of um, knowing you have a vision and you know that you're here for a specific, maybe, you know, for specific things that you want to birth or mm -hmm. you feel like is on your life to, to create. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the material and saying, okay, now we know the material. How do we get this material to build this? Or is that like happening? Yeah, no, or like, yeah, or well, do you give up on that and you move or you switch? Or what does that look like? I think you have to strip the expectations away and get to the essence of what you're trying to build. That's good. And I think sometimes our expectations, we mistake it for what we're actually trying to build. So this would be a practical example, like yeah. a house. Let's say we're, everyone's goal is to build a house. Yeah. Okay, the goal is a house. But whenever we say house, every one of us has an idea of what the house should look yes, like. Yes, that's what true. The material, the design, the thought, the the essence of that house. And so when we can't find the material that that meets the expectation, 
then we're like, I can't live my vision. No, the ultimate vision is to build a house. Yeah. We then have to hold the rest of it loosely going, what is the house going to be made out of? Yeah. Like if you're going to move to a specific country somewhere in the world today and you want to build some X house, yeah. but all you have is straw, all you have is a bunch of big leaves, yeah. then guess what? You need to get rid of how you think the house should be built and build it with the material that actually exists. That's good. So I think I wonder if sometimes it feels like our expectation becomes – the, the the reason why or the essence instead of going, no, it's actually the house. So when we came here, like we want to build, I think it would be fair for everybody. And I know everyone on this team here, like we all have expectations. We do. And it would be abnormal if you didn't. Yeah. That's just the human nature. Yeah. But we also have had to learn how, oh, I thought we were building this kind of house with these windows, with these doors, with these faucets. Yeah. And we're like, once the sooner we got rid of the specifics, and got back to, oh, we are going to build a house, but what material? Once we identify the material, then it becomes fun. It becomes uh, adventurous. It becomes yeah. it's a fun learning process. This is my medium that I'm building. And then through. me yeah. coming from the West Coast, mm-hmm. moving to the Southeast, I've tried my best, and I, I, I believe I've done well with it, but that is try to understand the nuance of a culture, specifically in this region. Yeah. And the challenge is for leaders, we want to change a culture that already exists instead of embracing it first. Mm-hmm. And sometimes like, well, I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it. And I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to come in with that perspective. Yeah. I want to come in. What is the culture? What, what's beautiful about it? What can we celebrate about the culture in the Southeast? Yeah. And we're still on that journey. I think we should always, so that's where the curiosity piece comes there in for is. me. Yeah. Like I want to be curious. Why are the trees the way they are? Yeah. Why is the climate the way it is? Why is the material, instead of just saying, I like it or don't like it, saying, once you start understanding why the material is the way it is and get to the essence of it, then you actually gain an appreciation for it. Yeah. So that's some of it for me. Man, I love that because my immediate thought is what would happen to even the way that we do church if all of us as church leaders question why or or just asked why mm-hmm. why do we do this why do we do this i don't i don't know just adding that curiosity and and what do you think as far as like coming into a culture and building and then owning up to that what do you think that leaders can do to i mean a look internally i mean and admit that i mean what what would be good steps for leaders to do to like first admit it and then how do we help change it? How do we shift it? Or how do we find it inside of us? You know what I mean? So Yeah, and I, I was actually talking to one of our team. In our staff meeting this week, we had a big discussion around, yeah. okay, we, we have our existing model of how we meet with our leaders, train them, raise them, and gear them. And it's, it, you, know, we, you know, you have your leaders. Yeah. Reva has her leader. Candace has her. I have, we all have the elite. And some are overlapping our world. Some <laughs> serve in three different areas. Yeah, so we have, we have all of those dynamics. And so in the staff meeting this week, I said, what if we scratch that entire model? Is there, is this working? Mm -hmm. Is it, is there a better, more efficient way to actually pour into our leaders and do our leadership team structure when it comes to our volunteers and what we call it the dream team? And so we spent 30 minutes like, okay, let's just pretend like there's a better way to do it. And we spent 30 minutes and we kind of got to the end and we realized right now there's nothing, it, it, it's not a simple fix. No. So we said, okay. So I think as a leader, you have to ask yourself, uh, we have to ask ourselves, every once in a while we have to go, is there a better way to do this? Yeah. And explore that. And what always happens in those kind of conversations are someone will hold on to the way it's been done. That's it. And will bring it into, and I'm like, we just we have to leave that and light it on fire for a moment. Well, see, pretend like yeah. it's not working. And something, so I have to go, let's not bring that into the ideation right now. Let's leave that over here. And that's hard because some are like, hard. no, this is this work. And I'm like, so that's the challenge. No, I will admit, like for me, that was, I walked away actually being um, encouraged as far as my team because that made me look and be like, okay, I've led this certain way mm-hmm. in this atmosphere or in this environment and it worked, right? Like, and I could easily say, this is the way to lead a team. Mm-hmm. And then we move here and it's completely different playbook, mm-hmm. different environment, different culture. And so if I continue to think this is the only way to lead mm-hmm. and, and I say this is, you know, and I'm not like able to actually expand and ask myself, hey, what can I 
do differently? Or what is, you know, how do I make my people thrive in this? And it might be a completely different playbook. Mm-hmm. Um, then, then I like, it's funny because I get mad at myself because I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm at the forefront of things, but why am I, why am I dragging my feet here and saying this is the only way to lead is, is this way? And, and it's like, wow, I had to really check myself and say, okay, how do I do things better? How do I look and not, and be more pliable as a leader and, and not arrogant as well? I think there's a bunch of ego in that is, yeah. <laughs> oh, it, it's a huge thing. I think for leaders, people that are listening that are responsible for Again, it could be just your home and your family and your your spouse and your kids or, or your the housemates, however, yeah. all the way up to leading an organization. One of the challenges of the leader, and I and this is probably the one that it, it hits me differently, in, in meaning it's important to me, is I'm actually also responsible for how comfortable we get. Yeah. Because if I'm not careful, we can get so comfortable and get so dialed and managed that initiating an idea to do something different, now we have to work getting all these people uncomfortable again or willing to get uncomfortable again to accept the idea of something different. Yes. So on some level, as a leader, I have to measure how managed, how comfortable, how dialed everything gets. Because we all want everything to get dialed, and it's just normal, like you said. like, But... If I'm not careful, if we let six months, a year, two, three years mm-hmm. go by, and we never initiate a change, and, and I'll be, when we moved from our Sunday evenings to <laughs> Sunday mornings, yes. it was re- most, of our, most of our leadership, uh-huh. most of our staff, yeah. and most of our volunteer leads, most of them, not all of them, but a majority for sure, yeah. were opposed to the idea. Yes. And I realized, Kenneth and I realized, like, oh, we've gotten a little too comfortable change is now really hard to embrace. And we were only a, two years old at that point. It was like, so that just tells you, oh, you can get really set in a 12, 24 month period yeah. easily. And then we met then So we were supposed to make the change on this month. Yeah. And I remember we, we got to that point and it, there was such a visceral reaction to yeah. this, like, well, we're, you know, all these list of reasons and they were valid, understandable, yeah. but there was such a reaction that I made the decision, let's give this a few more months. months. And and we did. And guess what? The reaction was still the same, same two or three months later. Yeah. And that's when I finally just started. And you were there. You heard me. It's yeah. like the canister too, like saying, okay, guys, this is what we're doing. Yes. You're going to have to get on board with it. Yeah. We've given enough time to process the reason why we shouldn't, all the emotional, mental, practical reason, but we are now doing this. Yeah. So we did it. We moved it. It was in November of 23, I believe it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And within a month, almost all of the ones that were opposed to the idea, and some of them very passionately, yes. came to us and said, you know what, this was a better move. Yeah. So it's not a, a knock on anybody. No. It's just a reality of as a leader, sometimes it's like if things get too comfortable, it can be that much harder to create change. Yeah. So keeping the culture in somewhat of a space of where like change is initiated. And this is why most churches still have the same organ player. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Or the piano can never move. Yeah. Because this is how it's always been. Yeah. And so, I mean, we've heard, we've heard, you know, the statement, success is the greatest enemy of change. Mm -hmm. And it's true. Um, The easiest way to change is when something's failing. But sometimes people just prefer to keep failing because it's it's what they know. It's easier. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's a real dynamic. So I think as a leader, it's important to continually initiate change and put everything back on the table. That's good. And I don't think I do it enough. I'm, I realize I don't know if I even do this enough in my own life. Yeah. And so I think it's something we can call ourselves to another dimension of like put everything on the table frequently. So uh, one of our staff I met with this week, we were talking about this and, and she said something to the effect of like, I, I need, I need to do better at changing and, and questioning everything. Mm-hmm. I said, why don't you do this at the end of every week? At the end of every month, look at the last month and say, did that work well? Yeah. Is there anything I could do differently? And then, and then so looking backwards and then looking forward, look at the next three months and go, and I asked her, what are your whys? And she said, my biggest whys are I want my team to feel connected yes. and I want them to be spiritually growing. I said, great. So now look at the next three months and go, is everything on the calendar, everything we planned, is it going to contribute to our team being more connected? Yeah. And is it going to be contributing to spiritual growth? And if you can't answer solidly, then you need to change everything that's happening in the next okay. three months. Yeah. So I think we have to build in things that help us to embrace change. Okay. So then why 
I'm going to say this is a big C yeah. church, not like just yeah. individually. But like, do you think that we're doing that as a as a church and looking at culture? And I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying mm-hmm. we shift like the fundamentals, Bible, all mm-hmm. the things. But we definitely have a culture that, in, and you can see it in all the statistics, mm-hmm. that are leaving the church in droves um, or they're going to like more traditional like yep. Catholicism, things like that. Mm-hmm. And my question is, are we looking at that and saying, okay, our goal is for people to meet Jesus. If that's like the bottom line, that's the house that we're building. Mm -hmm. Um, Can we look at our systems Mm -hmm. and say like, what needs to shift? What needs to change? Mm -hmm. Um, What are we doing on a regular basis that is not meeting or, and and I know we don't want a baby and I get all that, but like Mm -hmm. really meeting a culture, like what is... What is, yeah, yeah, some of it's connected to the goals, too. So, for example, if the expectation is that Sunday gatherings should meet all yeah, yeah. these things, then if the expectation's there, then it also will reflect what needs to change. Dang. But if the expectation is only on, let's just say, we just want this to be a corporate gathering where people experience God, and we, uh, we spend time in the presence of God through our worship— through our giving, through our fellowship, yeah. and that we are giving practical teachings that help to move us more into being like Jesus. Let's oh. just say it's as simple, yeah, yeah, as, simple that. as that. Then, then, then the where you need to change can just be on that. But I think that some of the mistakes that have been made are the expectation on church is the list is so long. Yeah. I was talking to a friend this morning. And they're from the South, born and raised here. And I said, I'm learning so much about the Southeast. And this is my personal experience. It doesn't mean I'm right. Yeah. This is my personal experience. The expectation on the pastor and the church here is much larger. Mm-hmm. And it, it, the list is longer, I should say. Yeah. You're responsible for all these areas in my life. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm not used to having that much expectation. Yeah. And so that's been a journey of, as a leader of trying to navigate all of those dynamics. Yeah. And, so, and so I think some of it is like what... What are the expectations and what's realistic? Yeah, but then I would think that that's where teaching has to come in, right? Like, um, so like coming in and seeing what we're building with, mm-hmm. I think that's been, um, you. it's easy for you to say like, hey, don't put expectation on Sunday, uh, but that's your culture. And so I'm thinking like, so let's say it is everyone, like a, a certain demographic of people that their culture is to yeah. put their whole faith in a Sunday service, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, we're saying, hey, you need to, you know, find Jesus outside of it. You need to find community outside of this. Don't just base it all on a Sunday service. Mm-hmm. Um, so where is that teaching? We would have to completely change our teaching, I guess, in this area or wherever we are that has that that expectation. And again, like, how does that, like, what kind of um, programs are we doing to help with that mindset? It just is kind of a cool I mean, as a leader, if we want to change culture or we want to say, hey, this is going to actually build health in this area. And we see this as like a mm-hmm. um, within our people. Like, how do we shift that yeah. um, and teach I, differently? I would say I have even adjusted my approach to Sunday morning since I've moved here. Yeah, okay. Because I recognize the culture here actually had a different expectation on Sunday gathering than what I'm currently used to. Okay. So I would say in my own way, whether it's obvious or not, internally I'm like, oh, I need to give more emphasis here and I've not really given it much emphasis. Yeah. And so I feel like I'm also adjusting to the 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 environment in the south at least in this region that we're in. Like, oh, where I've not emphasized what happened on a Sunday, it's actually something I should because that is part of the dynamic here. Instead yeah. of trying to change the culture to match the way I think it should be, I feel like I've given a little, given takes in some areas. Yeah. So some of it's that. Uh, my philosophy on Sunday is that it's a part of the whole. It's not the whole. You know, it, it, yeah. it can't be. You it can't, can't be. It just can't. Yeah. That's just unrealistic. Yeah. Um, you know, someone recently just was telling us, like, I, I love my community in my home. We, we meet, we, I think it's every week. We love all that, but we feel like we're missing something. And we're like, yeah, what, you, what your heart longed for is actually right over here. Yeah. So that's why I will continue to champion, whether it's big C, small C, home church, Whatever house church. Yeah. I mean, everything in between or yeah. no church or we don't, you know, we, we, you know, all the different opinions. I'm like, 
is not either or. No. It's got to be both and, and, I mean, a bunch of both and. Yeah, there's got to be a bunch. So I think, I think that's part of that dynamic of, of people's expectations of what they want out of church. Yeah. So to get back to your original question around change, yes. yeah, I think we should always be asking, where, where should we change? I don't think much, I think mostly on internal stuff when it comes to change. Mm-hmm. What can we change internally to be more efficient yeah. and to be more productive and to be more impactful? Those are things that I'm constantly wrestling with. Yeah. And then are we actually making steps towards this vision idea that we have? Yeah. And th- those are the where I'm constantly putting everything back on the table saying, is this working? Yeah. You know, for some it's like, why are the meeting an hour long? Yes. Just asking this, what, does it need to be an hour? Yeah. Oh, it needs to be an hour and a half. Oh, it needs to be 30 minutes. Yeah. Whatever it is. And so I think it's just kind of asking why a lot. Why? That's And, yeah. um, and that, that, that ties back into what you talked about as far as curiosity. Yeah. No, and being, I think as a leader, that's our number one point, that, mm-hmm. or at least one of them, that we have to stay curious um, and constantly be asking the questions, especially when the people, when, when we have different people that we're serving. Mm-hmm. Um, I also think it's really interesting because right now, you know, you listen to kind of the buzz that's happening in the Christian world. And it's like, oh, we've put a platform too much on worship leaders and they've gotten to, mm-hmm. um, you know, celebrity status. And I'm like, hey, let's let's look internally for a second for all of us leaders that have been leading. Mm-hmm. And we have put, you know, because of that, um, because of success or money or whatever, maybe we, again, got comfortable with it. And we were like, well, it's paying the bills and it's paying the bills well or, you know, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. And so then we don't actually come back and ask the whys because it hasn't fallen apart yet. And then when it starts to fall apart, then we start asking the whys because it's easier for like kind of what you were saying. It's almost easier to ask the questions after mm-hmm. it starts to fall apart. Yeah. So, yeah. The celebrity <laughs> thing is very interesting because the same people that complain about celebrities are the ones that made them a celebrity. That's what I'm saying. Right? That is, it's just it's still, and it doesn't mean we disregard and don't have honor for that person. No, no, no. But it's really interesting when we talk about when we talk about specifically the celebrity culture within a church, it's like you actually are created the celebrity. You're the one that contributed to them getting elevated to whatever we call the celebrity status. And yet they're the first one to criticize them for being that. You have, so it's, that, that is, that's a really strong dynamic there. Yeah. And this is why I will continue to come back to you. I got in trouble for saying this when we <laughs> talked about spiritual gifts yes. and prophets. Yeah. Like it has to be rooted in a local church. Yes. Whatever size, that's your preference. But it, it needs to be, it needs to be rooted within a local church. Once something leaves the confines of a local church, the I have seen over and over, m- not every time, but I would definitely say a lot of the times, this is where people, individuals, get off the rails spiritually, get off the rails mentally and emotionally because there's. The idea of a local church is something Jesus created, and there's so many built-in mechanisms to keep you emotionally healthy, Mm -hmm. to keep you mentally and spiritually healthy. And when you remove it and you stop serving this thing that Jesus created, and you start making it about something else, it's not a surprise that it starts moving down this road. And, and, And unfortunately, we're seeing this repeat itself over and over. I was talking to a, a... talking to a lot of people lately yeah. actually keep saying that but a friend who had a, a beautiful worship movement for years and seeing dynamic with some of the main voices just kind of just falling off the cliff yeah. in their walk with god and relationships and he made this comment he says from here on out specifically in the area of worship from here on out all of our people that are doing worship have to stay and serve the local church and everything needs to be an expression out of that not move out of it and then do it. Yes. And so that's why I will continually, I, I still believe strongly, like the whole prophetic, all these gifts we're talking about, it's primarily for the church. And it's to primarily to equip and train and to serve the church. And then out of that, we're giving to the world. That's the missional, yeah. And versus like, okay, now I've gotten to a status. I don't need to serve the church anymore. I now move outside of the church to serve the world. I've seen so many people, it just gets really slippery. Yeah. And so I think the church actually provides safeguards, mechanisms, accountability, and healthy practices that keep us, that keep us uh, in a much healthier spot. 
when it comes to culture. Yeah, and I think that's where kind of what we were going after is that leaders have to have the ownership Mm -hmm. of like what we've created inside of the cultures that we're around. And, you know, I was having a conversation with some friends uh, a couple days ago. And we were talking about how the pendulum likes to swing, right? Mm-hmm. But we've swung into, like, we talked for a long time growing up, like, Jesus and God has become the father and, you know, the friend. And that's incredible. And I know we've talked about this in other podcasts, but if you don't have the uh, the awe of just the fact that it's God that created the universe, then all of a sudden it becomes so familiar that it becomes almost internal where it becomes me. Mm-hmm. And then we haven't we don't know what it's like to even suffer or to like go through something that's hard without being like, God, you're, where are you? And I think that's kind of what we're seeing is that we've preached this as leaders because this is where the pendulum swing. And then we missed out on, on kind of balancing it. So again, looking at ourselves and saying, okay, like, yes, maybe our people need this, but maybe in a couple of months we need to shift over here because even if this is comfortable and everybody loves what we're saying, we might need to go back to, hey, there's some times where life's going to be hard. Yeah. Um, and so looking internally, because that's really easy, I think is, uh, I love what you said um, when we were kind of talking beforehand just about looking in and seeing what we need to change mm-hmm. because when we don't, then I, I think you said like you start to change everyone around you <laughs> instead yeah, of if, yourself. If you believe you can't change or you're unwilling to change and you will automatically start trying to change everything around you yeah you start trying to change the people you do life with you start trying to change the church you go to Mm -hmm. you start trying to change the establishment you're going to yeah you start you'll change all your external dynamics but that if you don't believe you can change or you're unwilling to change yeah and so i think if to sum up this conversation i think it's a great landing point and that is we have to stay in the mindset like, I am willing to change, I want to change, I want to improve as a human. If I can keep it there, then it will naturally transpire and change the environments around me instead of, and that's, that's, that's really easy to do when it's gl- bl- glaringly obvious you need to change. Yeah. But when it's not obvious, that's when it's really hard to change. Yeah. And I think we need to understand that there are certain areas in our life that we just cannot see. And we call them blind spots. Yeah. These are the spots in life. I, I, I don't even know this is a problem. And that's why the culture around you, the community around you can make that obvious to you. And I was talking to someone yesterday about this as well. And they're like, I, my wife is telling me things and I cannot see it. <laughs> I'm trying so hard. Yeah. Like, it's like to foreign language. And I said, that's called a blind spot. And the more you can respect your wife in this process and actually just follow her lead in this, that blind spot will get smaller and smaller. Mm. And so I, I think we just, we have to stay in the posture. I want to change. I want to improve. I believe I can change. Yeah. And I want to, and, or else we're just blaming everyone. So maybe if you're blaming everything around you, it's because we're unwilling to change. That's really good. And I also would think like, because we're seeing a mass of uh, movement of deconstruction, mm-hmm. and I'm and I, I always co- quite often wonder that, like yeah. if if you don't like where things are, or you you don't feel like maybe a church is doing certain things that you want, then what are you doing it about? Like what like if you want to see a deeper relationship with God, like it, in church, mm-hmm. but you aren't making the sacrifice to spend time with Him, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's that you know culture's caught, not taught, and mm-hmm. and that's what I like as a leader. I have to go back to that. Like if I want an environment to be a certain way, I have to go. I have to do it first, yeah. so that when people are around me, they catch it mm-hmm. and not being like head knowledge, like this is what you should do if I'm not walking it. Yeah. So I think that's really important. And I think it would yeah. help with all of our deconstruction friends here. Yeah. I would also say for people that are in an environment, whether studio or any other environment, if you have, if you have such a drive to change that environment, put that on hold. Yeah. And do your best to understand the vision and heart and serve the environment first. Because yeah. you might learn, oh, these things are in place, and I was unaware of why they were in Why they were there. Oh, but that's people the People come up to me often, and they, they're, they're there for a month. Yeah. Hey, you should really consider X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, uh, you've only been here for a month. Huh. Um, you don't know who we are yet, and that's no one's fault. You just yeah. don't know us well yet. Why don't you take the next six, seven, eight months and get to know us and serve? Like, get in the trench with us. Yes. And then after that, we can have these kind of conversations. Yeah. 
And I think I think more leaders need to ask people to actually, hey, come serve and and get in the trench with that, and then you'll understand. This is why this, this thing is, is why here. Is this this is, like, is why yeah. that thing is here. Yeah. This and it's like, and then all of a sudden your perspective changes, and so I think that that would be that would be amazing. We could do that more. Yeah. And I think we could go, I think that would be a fun conversation to go into is that when you get into the trenches, what it does to expand mm-hmm. your mind mm-hmm. and maybe let go of like the, I know everything and mm-hmm. that I see a lot. Serving yeah. does that. Mm-hmm. And I Like did. Emily right here and Josh yes. right here and Jeffrey, they have been with us from day one. Day one. So when they say, hey, I've got an idea, or I think it has all my attention. Yes, wait, yeah. I hope you guys know that, but it's genuinely like, hey, we should try this, or what about this? I'm like, oh, you have my attention. Why? Because you've been in the trench for three years, yeah. starting something from nothing. You had a life, you gave it up, and moved here to be a part of this. And so I'm like, oh, you have all my ears. Yeah. You have my heart, you have my ears, you have my mind, you have it all. Um, that that right there, that when, ch- when change gets introduced, it's way more productive because they're like, my hands are dirty. I've been, I've been in the trench with know this. Know the thing. soil. I yeah. know the soil. I mean, your husband, Adam, I mean, the list, we have a yeah. huge list of people. And then there's a whole nother group. Like, they're just getting to know us. I'm like, yeah. just get to know us. <laughs> just get in the trench and serve with us. We, we want to see you show up. We got lots of things for you to do. You can come help us. Oh, yeah. We got, we got plenty to do. <laughs> but, the, but the same to them. Like, when they, when they spend time in the trench with us and they start speaking up, I'm like, Okay, I, you have my attention. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to do everything, and yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to act like I. I know everything. Yeah. But I also want to know you. Hey, you're in this for the long haul. Yeah. You're in this to like you. You want to get your hand dirty. Okay. Now let's create the future. Yeah. That's and good. that to me is way more meaningful, way more um, intentional, and it's a better long term result. Wow. So. Okay, so to wrap this right. up, leaders, <laughs> we talked about look a few, internally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> look internally. If you don't like your like the culture that you're building or seeing, like mm-hmm. you need to look internally, mm-hmm. see if there's some blind spots. Yeah. And leaders need to get into the local church as well mm-hmm. and find people that can pour into them and yeah. keep them accountable. And and th- I would say this goes for like any organization yeah, at some not, level, but yeah. yeah, it's it's true. So. That's awesome. All right. Yep. There's another was, one. Was a good chat. It was a good chat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, tell all your friends about it. Yeah. Hit the uh, five star. Uh, oh, no, five one, star. One, two, three, four are not an option. No. Right, Emily? Five star. Just hit the five star. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Have a great guy. day, everyone. Yeah. Yes.